Good morning and very welcome to OTBAM on a Wednesday. We're doing the natural laugh at the start of the show. The, the <laughs> Who does that? Do the newsreaders like read, read the, pretend to like look, be on their laptop at the end of the show? That's, that's our laugh at the start of the show. It's a real it? American thing, isn't it? It's a Colin Buhig thing. It's, that's why we're laughing at the start of the show there. Uh, sorry, Adrian Barry, good morning. Morning, Shane. Ashling O'Reilly, good morning. Good morning, Shane. How are things? How are you keeping? Not too bad, all good. good. Uh, a quiet night in football. Frank Lampard, it turns out, has uh, had a rude awakening to his return as Chelsea manager. Four games, four defeats, one goal scored, seven conceded. Um, it's not going to plan, is it, for Todd Bowley or for Frankie? Uh, no. Um, no, no, no. Definitely not for Todd Bowley. I would argue less so on Frank. You know, like it's not that he, he obviously, there's a weirdness about this whole story. It's a very complex thing that we mm. can probably spend a couple of hours talking about, I think. But um, Let's do that, Adrian. <laughs> yeah. If only we had a show that lasted two and a half hours, <laughs> we, could, we could really get into this. Uh, it just feels like there's a weird sort of a, like a laughing at Frank stuff going on. Um, from fa- fans, certainly a little bit of in the media, like he's a bit of a uh, caricature. People, uh, you know, people are hoping that he'll fail um, because they can poke a bit of fun at him. Has he really done that badly on his return? Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't know all yet. Four games. Yeah, all four games, tough games, tough games. Two, two of them against yeah, Real Madrid, yeah. right? Two of them against Real Madrid, who are scoring goals for fun. Like even if you look at the game last night, right? If you start, and the, sorry, the other one was it Wolves? The other one, Colmes. Wolves and Brighton. Yeah. Brighton, Brighton are a really good team. Mm. There's any team in the league could lose to Brighton at the minute. I mean, not without Evan Ferguson at the exact minute, but generally they're a really good team, and it's not just him. They have players all over the park. So, I think that everything in in a bit of context here. The manager didn't lose his job because they were going very well. The manager lost his job because they were crap. So he's coming into a team who are as low as a snake's belly, as the expression goes, and uh, haven't been playing very good football, and for all the money they spent, don't have a striker. Mm. So, like, you look at them last night for 60 minutes, and I thought it was a good case point, because actually, I was happened to be in the studio last week after the first leg, and I kind of felt for the first 15 minutes of the game last week, they were really good. Like, mm. they could have scored a goal inside the first two or three minutes last week. They scored two goals in the first five minutes. They could have had three after about 15. Now, they didn't take any of those. And last night was an extension of that across 60 minutes. Uh, Joanne had a great stat on the coverage last night that they had... Um, bum, 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 86 shots for one goal in April, in the month of April. Mm. So, like, I know... That, does, that doesn't say to me that the manager's doing something incredibly bad. That says to me that they're creating an awful lot of chances. I still don't fully understand how... So they don't have a striker. Somebody After spending just, 600 million. Yeah, and that's, great, not, but that's not Frank's fault. No, no. But and, and I also don't understand how... So we, we say they don't have a striker as a reason why they haven't converted more of those 86 chances. Like as, fair, as, as, as a professional footballer, like looking at some of the chances they got last night. Yeah, you're like, come oh on. Oh my God, you're well, like playing football the, mm. for as a professional. That ball's fallen to Kante, that's the point. If they had bought a striker, that ball's fallen to he, a he proper does, striker. He, he does play... Too far up the pitch. Frank was a bit like that the last time he was at Chelsea. Mm. Figures that N'Golo Conte should be playing further up the pitch. I think that if they had an actual striker, they could probably rely a little bit less on that. Were you surprised that he came back in? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was surprised. And by the way, it's not that I'm not. It's not, I'm not all sort of singing and dancing about Frank Lampard here. Like it's. I just think that he needs oh, to be cut. cut, cut <laughs> he needs to be cut it. a bit of a break. I was surprised. I watched the Liverpool game that he was at the day before I think that he got announced and I definitely thought oh there's a nice shot of Frank that's that's great now I wonder he's he not on punditry or whatever he must be just just there for the night and then he was like obviously in a director's box or whatever so it was a bit of a surprise the next morning where uh, to me when all that sort of came out well but he was supposed to be doing punditry wasn't he for the first that first game he took in charge of Chelsea he was down to do punditry mm. at the Real Madrid game wasn't it um, so he was down. Oh, was he? I think so. Yeah, right. he'd been down and obviously had to change Jesus his plans. But Christ. so you can't you can't blame Frank for taking the job. Like if you're if he's going to get offered that job yeah. for the rest of the season, the amount of money he's going to get for this he, makes sense he from his it. perspective. Yeah. But like, where <laughs> you just wonder, will it do more damage than good for thing. his reputation I, I, as a manager? 100%. Like that, look, that is a good question, and I'm going to come off like the one here who's saying that Frank Lampard is the reincarnation of a young Alex Ferguson. I'm not saying that at all. He obviously. Um, I I do believe that uh, Chelsea is a definitely a level above where he should be. I I agree with that all day long. Yes. But neither do I think that he's the clown that he's being painted, and he doesn't know what no. he's doing, and he's fumbling around. Who, but who's painting him as a clown? You think the you media just pick up a lot of the papers today, and there is a bit of a sneering about, like, frankly, not good enough. There's all yeah. this sort of stuff going on. There does feel to be a bit of a sneering about him. And as I said, it's not that I don't think he has shortcomings. Like you look at the game last night, there. 
they they should absolutely unquestionably be unquestionably have been ahead on 60 minutes last night there's no doubt about it they they had created a whole lot of chances the difficulty against a team like madrid is once you concede you have to go after the game and i actually was impressed in some ways that they only lost 2-0 in the end because they were obviously committing more players forward mm. they made the substitutions i'd be critical of them for the length of time it took them to make the substitutions it was basically 10 minutes after madrid scored Everybody, the writing's on the wall after Madrid go one up. There's no need to hang off on your, uh, you know, um, Joao, uh, Felix, uh, Mudrick and Sterling come on. What was that about? What was his decision making there? You, we, like, so yeah. Frank does, obviously, Chelsea not having a striker is not Frank's fault, as you say. But Ch- Frank picked the team last night. Yeah. Yes. It felt like the wrong, mm. obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, but it well, felt like the wrong approach. What, what if what if Kante had scored that goal? You're 2 nil down, you're, you're 2 nil down already. But but what if Kante had scored that goal and it got to 2 1? We'd be having a very different conversation, I think. Would Sterling today. or Felix, if that, or Felix as he likes to be pronounced, would. As would, is his actual name. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> as he likes to be pronounced. His name. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Felix. Uh, but if that ball had fallen to Felix or Ster- Sterling, that there's a higher percentage chance that, that ball's end in the back of the net. Uh, so po- possibly. Is that not possibly. on Lampard then to be putting proper players in number 10 position that can score? I wouldn't be look you can you certainly argue that as we sit here in the cold light of day tomorrow well, yeah. I, uh, uh, today 55 60 minutes into the game yesterday I wasn't thinking like that I thought geez if they get a goal here this is on. Now the only thing is it is Real Madrid uh they've scored over their last um uh, seven, uh, bum, 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 uh, six games in April so far and have scored 17 goals right so the idea that you're not going to concede against Madrid in a game like that mm. in a team like Chelsea at the minute yeah. is highly unlikely anyway um, but I don't know look at well, I, they had 19 I, shots Chelsea last night yeah, yeah. like that, no, that, that, that's chances. not a team that don't know what they're doing I'm sorry that like you can read all the reports this morning and listen to all the experts but that is not a team that don't know what they're doing but sure it's results business you can't lose you can't take charge of a team and then lose your first four games and expect expect headlines that don't I'm saying I'm saying all bit. this in the context that I don't think anybody could have made a case for Chelsea beat Madrid no, I don't. Rafa Benitez tried to do it in the papers yesterday, which was which I found hilarious. He was like, "This is how Liverpool or Chelsea can can turn it around tonight." I'm like, mm. Come on, Rafa! I know you're desperate for a job, but this is not <laughs> this is not the way to approach it. You look at, when you're looking at the odds for an ex Chelsea manager. This is uh, who will be in charge of the first game of next season. Nagelsmann is still the favourite, narrowly ahead of Luis Enrique and Maurizio Pochettino. So any, there's still any, the big any, names, but any, any of those any of those managers that wouldn't. Okay, four 0 over two legs. <clears throat> Losing two 0 to Madrid in a, in a game of football is not a bad result. It's not a bad result. There's not an awful lot of teams in the Premier League that would come away with mm-hmm. with only a two 0 defeat. Um, any of those managers that would have done any better than him over the two legs? The problem now is they're not going to get Champions League football for next season. So why would any of those managers take over Chelsea? And look at the yeah, state of their squad. Yeah, the, the, the money. Well, that's the moolah, but the moolah, I think mm-hmm. That's like yeah, but it could be a bad PR move for them. Like mm. you know, if if if. You walk into a dressing room with so many characters. Sure, we, we were talking earlier in the season about the fact that Chelsea players have to use a couple of dressing rooms in training sessions because there's not enough room for the size of their squad. Um, the amount of egos in that team as well. Sure, even players like Felix and, and Mudrick and Sterling on the bench. A lot of lads are not going to want to be there next season because mm-hmm. they're not getting game time. They're not going to get Champions League football. We know that. So why would Nagelsmann, Enrique, Pochettino, these lads take that job? Like Lampard is actually the fourth favourite to be permanently in Why's charge he? next season. It's not the craziest idea. It isn't like it's not beyond the realms of possibility. If he, I, I don't believe that the football. I'm obviously saying the chances they're creating. Yeah. If they start to convert a couple of those, maybe they need a couple of players to come in. Yeah, they need a striker. But even when you're naming like out all those players, like they've such a serious yeah, squad when you yeah. think about it, that oh. they're actually like where they're sitting at the minute is is actually surprising. It's, an, it's mental. Yeah. I, I just don't know how anyone could control the egos in that dressing room. Clearly, Graham Potter couldn't. Uh, and and I definitely felt sorry for Potter. I think Potter has more sympathy than maybe Lampard. I don't know why. There is that kind of Lampard is a figure of ridicule to some, but yeah. but Todd Bowley is the real figure of, figure of ridicule here because I don't know how many times during the match last night the camera panned That's up to Bowley and it's like he, he's sitting on his phone at one point just before Real opened the scoring, and then it goes up to him two minutes later after the goal and he's just. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's. I, I think it's the unbelief. Yeah, he's look. Uh, he's not running the club. Well, he's going into the dressing room uh, uh, for an hour amazing. talking to the players. Look, I, sometimes that stuff gets... I don't know. I wasn't there. Who the hell knows, right? But like, the only thing we have evidence of is the amount of players he bought and the amount of money he spent and it hasn't been the smartest move in the world. And Potter paid the price for that. 
Um, mm. Lampard is to a degree paying a little bit of the price now as well. Uh, him appearing on the screen is a difficult one because like, he's been spoken about in a way that a lot of owners don't get spoken about and uh, again, there's that bit of a figure of fun thing. Mm. Um, I d- d- the Madrid, on the other hand, by the way, just look so impressive again last night. Mm-hmm. Like Their calmness in front of the goal. Um, the, was it Vinicius Junior who gets it and Chelsea had had a chance up the other end just before that and they'd taken a bit of a swipe at it mm. out of like a bit of a panic and um, Courtois had come out and blocked down and blocked it away. I think it was Vinicius Junior who gets it and holds on to it in that little bit of calmness in the melee of the madness of what's going on in the box and just a little slovey little ball in for yeah. a three goal and they bury it. It's just... The second goal even as well. He took, he took his while to, I mean he had, he had an open goal but he took his while to tap that in. It's he like did. Waiting for, the, yeah. waiting for the challenge for the goalkeeper. So... It, yeah, it was it was a it was a perfect game management from Real. Mm. He felt like Ancelotti, and that's what they do best. One hundred percent game management. Like, they were they were ridiculously good. A couple of comments are coming in on Chelsea here on the the YouTube channel. Uh, Stephen Donlan says last time Chelsea didn't make Champions League, they still managed to get Conte in and win the league the following season. So not having Champions League football doesn't put off big managers. That's maybe a fair point. Um, like Chelsea, you're still a big club. It's I big think job. if you're a big manager, you sort of say to yourself, it's nearly, it's nearly you're nearly it's nearly you're nearly better off going in there. Because they're at, they're can at only a go low. Up. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're like a hero if you get Champions League football. That's You don't need to win the league even the next year. That's it's why for Lampard coming in now to lift the mood at this point in the season, I just... Yeah, it should be perfect. It's, oh. It should be perfect. As in, it was so low under Potter. But then he comes in... But also for him at this point, the players are just well, yeah. like, there's no chance. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're done. It's yeah. come close to the <laughs> end. Out. You know, I'm, next year, yes, okay, next season, there's there's more of a chance. I wonder, I was looking at the aftermath of the game last night and I could see Lampard going around and like Modric is over and they're having a bit, of, they're having a little bit of a chat and a hug and Ancelotti is over and then a bit of a chat and a hug. <laughs> like, I feel a bit like there's a bit of the Roy Keynes about him. Mm. Like, none of those personalities are talking to Lampard as the manager. Yeah. There's a game recognises game which yeah. has nothing to do with his You're abilities as a manager. It's like, let's let's just acknowledge each other here, Madrid. There's a bit of a... Like, a bit of a Roy Keane there. Like. Yeah, like what, what was he? What did Lampard shout across the Jurgen Klopp that time? Was it during, was it during COVID? Oh, no, I quite, remember that. Quite yeah. clearly you could hear him shouting things to, to Jurgen Klopp. About giving him, it all that. Him not, not being a player. Something like that, and say, oh, you won the league last season, and you're giving it the big one, sort of. Oh sort of yeah, vibe. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was a bit, it was a bit he off. Was a player, of course, but of no, course. not, not at that level. At the high level. Uh, Colin making the point that uh, Chelsea appointment of Conte that was 2016-17, and there were fewer appealing jobs, which is maybe also also accurate. But there's a lot of there's a lot of big managers available. Oh yeah, like it's probably a time to to go for these lads, but. I, I don't know. Uh, is it Win Stanley? Is the Paul Win Stanley and Lawrence Stewart are the co sporting directors of Chelsea? They're the ones who decided to get rid of Graham Potter. Their names kind of go under the radar a little bit. In what sense? Uh, it, well, it, it, they made the decision to get rid of Potter now. Oh, yeah. Like there's there is the argument out there that maybe you sh- they should have held on to Graham Potter. Like you can't ju- you just can't keep firing and hiring managers. Mm. It doesn't mm-hmm. work like that. Well, th- that's clearly the likes of Todd Bowley has no problem doing it. But well, we were told that that was the one thing we were told about Todd Bowley when he takes over. He loves a long term project. Mm. There'll be no Graham Potter, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. That was the Don't whole thing with Graham yeah. Potter. That's but, what you're here to do, develop. Yeah. Like, develop yeah. the team. absolutely fine. A few of the comments. Uh, Noel Cal, you can blame him. Yes, you can blame him. His arrogance to believe he's good enough. Maybe admit he's not good enough. I assume you're talking about Lampard there. Um, Michael says, maybe Chelsea are paying the price for the changing he's of the He's not owners. going to come out and say, what's he going to, what do you expect him to do? <laughs> what do you expect yeah. him to say? Like, he's not yeah. going to come out and go, yeah, listen, I'm not up to this. 100%. And even last night, I'm just reading his quotes from after the match last night. He says, I won't let anyone off the hook in terms of seeing this season out. It has to be the opposite. He's talking about how many crosses they had, how many chances they had, how many shots yeah, they had. Yeah, didn't he say they were about the better team? He's they were, they, they, that, he, yeah. they, he was saying they were the better team for 60 minutes. Mm. You can make that case. You, you could make that case. Well, last it's night not, was it's the not most, crazy thought. It was the most promising performance of the four so far on yeah. the Lampard. So you have to give him the next. It's Brentford, I think, next for them. I okay. mean, that, well, it's not going to. That's not an easy Premier League no. game to, no. to to try and bounce back and get a three points in. Um, so no easy concerned. games that level, Shane. No easy games. It's a game of two halves as well, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Forty-five <laughs> minutes. Um, any other cliches you want to throw in there? Got to stick the ball in the onion sack. You do. Cetera, yeah, cetera. Yeah, 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 the onion sack. I like that one. <laughs> I usually go with the onion bag, but we'll we'll, we'll stick that one in as well. Um, what else we want to talk about? The GPA have a have a report out today. Now this was a. It it feels like not so, that's something we haven't we've seen before, but also it's quite concerning. So some of the the top level stuff from this uh, GPA report um, found that only nine point five percent of intercounty women's players receive travel expenses versus one hundred percent of the male players. Also found that eighty percent don't have regular access to a doctor, and forty eight percent. 
paid to see a physio with average cost of 220 euro um, there's talk talk about access to pitches as well 70% of female intercounty players uh, reported difficulties accessing pitches uh, and there are calls to compensate female players uh, for costs incurred from, from this year onwards it's on the back page of a lot of the, the newspapers this morning as well even the back of the window there has uh, GPS seek more croaker funds to end inequality in female codes uh, a lot of quotes from the GPS CEO Tom Parsons uh, but guys this is fairly stark when you read the figures here yeah, um, I don't know. I'm not really that surprised, though. Yeah. Um, you should be a bit more surprised, but I, I don't think I am. Like just to think about the Mead Camogie players, they played in Crow Park last weekend mm. in the league final against Kerry, lost by a point in the end. But up until that game, they were going around the country trying to find pitches um, for their training. They don't have a, a set base, so yeah, I think things like this are, are happening maybe across the country and on the expenses as well. I maybe thought it, maybe that had changed mm. 2023 we'd often heard the terrible stories up to now but I definitely thought there was more of an improvement there um, but I don't know how players do that when they're a lot of them nowadays the inter-county age is, is dropping they're in college they're either only coming out of leave insert some are only doing their leave insert how would they have the funds to get themselves to and from trainings you know to, to get themselves to matches to wherever it is to get on the bus to go to matches it's oh, very tough it's their parents are having to do it obviously and that's not easy in the times that we're in at the minute so yeah um, not on because a lot goes into being an inter-county player and then to on top of all of that to be having to worry about travel expenses so yeah it's it's terrible to, to hear those figures but yeah not overly surprised though mm-hmm. Who are the dissenting voices against this happening? I just can't understand. I actually, there was a bit of me that looked at the paper this morning and I thought, oh, is that a paper from somehow from yeah. like three years ago that is yeah. more than Groundhog Day, like. like, there's obviously this conversation that's gone on in the background that, um, is it Mary McAleese is heading up that yeah. committee where they're trying to obviously piece Merge the, them all, the yeah. Merge three, together, yeah. Um, things together. Which, again, like I know there are obviously you know, bits and pieces you need to get through, but like, uh, I can't, you know, I was looking at the, she was at the uh, Agreement 25 thing that was up in Queen's University, Belfast, the 25 years since the Belfast Agreement, and I was watching the George Mitchell speech last night, which, by the way, is a, I appreciate it's a mm. bit of a tangent here, an unbelievable watch, yeah. and I highly recommend it to go and look at. Uh, but she was hosting a panel after that, and she's obviously involved with trying to piece that thing together. I don't know what voices in the room are saying, like, uh, here, should we, what, you know, what what's stopping that happening, number one? And just on this bit, like George Mitchell was talking about, sort of, like he managed to get everybody in that room. You know the, the types of people and, and how at opposite ends of the scales they were, mm-hmm. scale they were to get them in a room and get that hammered out over a couple of years. This has been going on for forever yeah. since yeah. the games existed. I just don't understand how they couldn't, even almost separate to that other process of uniting the organisations, how couldn't they get everybody in a room? I just don't know what the counterpoint, if, if, if all the stakeholders are sat around a table Who's saying, well, we can't do this, or here's the reason not to do that? It just doesn't. What are the hurdles? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just get it done. That's the only way we're going to see change. Like 9.5%. That's bizarre, isn't it? To 100% for men. Like that is is quite crazy when you think about it. But yeah, I've. It, it's it's unbelievable really but yeah bringing them together merging them, that's the only way I could see really positive improvement but Could they get this done ahead of that would be what I would ask like twin track them separate that one like I don't know what the hurdles to getting that done again on the face of it look I'm probably very naive I can't see why the, everybody has a thirst to get it done just go and get it done mm-hmm. but to just get this done because they were talking like the big thing in the paper today is about trying to get it done by 2024 mm. and I don't know what the timeline for the uh, merging of the organisations would be it would appear that it might be slightly longer than that so on the basis of 2024 they're going to have to do it in parallel or separately I just go ahead and get it done yeah like, do, it, do it now if, if there's a will to get it done which there clearly is. Yeah. Um, I think we were, you were well, you were making the point before the show, actually, like the fact that people forget that these players, male and female players, but but clearly it's it's a bigger issue for female players because they're not getting the the same financial support. They have things to pay for. They have bills. They have mortgages. Some of them. It would turn you away from playing. Hundred percent. Because maybe you just can't do it. Like you a lot of these girls play. can't afford to play an amateur game because they can't get themselves to and from training mm-hmm. or to get themselves to the bus to go to, to the game or whatever it is. And it's not fair to do this to, to families, to parents, to have to put that on them. Mm. And, you know, I'm sure that they would like to 
you know, if they can be able to, you know, have their, their child playing. So, yeah, it's it's just unreal. But it's been going on for, for so, so long. Like, I remember years ago being involved and this was always the way. Mm. You know, you, you didn't get any expenses and, and it was tough. And What about access to pitches? Like, what was it, were there clear preferences for the male teams? Um, yeah, yeah, there always would have been. I think that's well known. Like, they maybe got the first pitch and you'd get the, maybe the second pitch, that sort of thing. They'd have food after training. Mm. We used to sort of, in fairness, it was probably a sound thing on their behalf. We didn't have the funds, obviously, within the LGFA, so it was the GA that had the money in Mead, so they basically would have their food and stuff after training and we used to go in after and if there was like, <laughs> you know, Scraps, when they're, well, I wouldn't say that, but like that they basically would, yeah, they would let us come in then, but we didn't have our own. You know, we just got to, you know, basically what was, yeah. they the, not leftovers because it was perfectly good food, but like maybe there was too much. So that's the food that we got then. Um, yeah, but that's desperate. But now that's, so I'm talking 2017, so I would think that there's been a lot of change since then. Obviously, we've seen the heights that Mead have gone to, so they're in a total different place to that. But I would say there is other counties that are not. Like you've heard about Cavan, like a lot of talk about the Cavan ladies this year and they just wanted the expenses, what they were told they were going to get. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of stories, I would say, uh, around the country, um, yeah, of players not getting their expenses, maybe not getting food after training and things like that. Do you think our basics, think the basic, so, yeah. basic rights to like have, the, I would the say. The quotes in the paper, so Mary McAleese and Tom Parsons, along the same lines, basically, they know that the finances are there within the GA to take female sports forward. So I think Parsons is quoting... In excess of 150 million euros a year, when you consolidate it, he says players' expenses are four or five percent of that because it's an amateur game. Half of revenue in other professional sports goes on salaries, so we don't have that cost. So he's saying even if the travel expenses on the, the men's side is increased uh, or doubled to eight percent, it's still the deal of a lifetime. The revenue is there. It's hard to argue with that. The money, the money is there within the GA to make to make this I see, happen. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Matthew Hanlon, who's the co-chair, obviously, since the GA and the GPA were merged. Uh, we want negotiations to start as soon as possible so that consistent work of the charter is in place for 2024 onwards. And um, You just wonder, like, obviously, the foundations of the GPA were very militant, um, you know, they, they were an old strike threat or a threat of a strike every now and then was uh, something that got thrown out. Yeah. Like, at some point or another, this can't go on for the players. Like, they will need to, at some point... If there's not a will being shown on all sides for people to get around the table and to actually get something done about it, maybe they just need to um, take a more of a hardline approach. I'd say there's drastic change from county to county, though. And I'd say mm. that's probably the thing. So you might see the top few counties mm. that are maybe getting their expenses and yeah. stuff. We'll have to look into this. But I would say there's a lot that are getting nothing. So I'd say it's quite a divide to yeah. when you have the strike, some are happy, some aren't. That sort of thing. So Grace Walsh is in the paper. She's being quoted for at this uh, GPA report launch. The Kilkenny Camogie captain. She's saying you're just treated less than your male counterparts, and that again feels like Groundhog Day. This feels like a story that's cropped up a number of times over the years. Even when you look at things like sports science. So I've already mentioned access to physios, strength and conditioning expertise, medical professionals, and then the training playing gear and the the nutritional expenses. We saw the Telegraph report on the the women's rugby team last week even access to protein, protein ahead yeah. of the, the Tour of Japan last year. So this this is something that has cropped up in Irish sport across coats. Like it's just, mm. the, level, the, the playing field you feel like in the last couple of years, every so often we pat ourselves on the back and we're like, this is getting better. We're definitely, we're definitely moving in the right direction. Then all of a sudden you see a report like this and you're like, are we, re are we? Yeah, I think it even stems from like underage. I yeah. think yes, that's where you start seeing it. Mm. Like I'd often hear like conversations within clubs and, they be deciding who gets what pitches, say. Yeah. And like I've heard of clubs giving their minor lads team the front pitch because maybe they have more supporters than the senior women's team. Jeez. That has been excuses that I've heard. And they're le they think they're legit. They're telling you the excuse going, what, really? Like these are stories that I've heard not that long ago, mm. you know, close to, enough to last season. So I think it stems from, from underage the whole way up of... Yeah, they they basically think, oh, they're better quality games. I don't know. But even, was it Anna Kiplis on the show? Yeah. Apologies if it wasn't. Right, it yeah, was, well, she yeah. was talking about the even meetings yeah. at, at rugby level where they discussed the men's first team and maybe the seconds and then the thirds and then maybe the under 20s and then they'll get into the down the age groups in the boys section, down to the mini leagues and it's it's any other, any other business at, at that stage and the, the women's team is maybe thrown in or someone has to put their hand up and say well what about the women's team are we going to discuss the issues there so like 
and, and look I'm sure that doesn't happen at every single rugby club or GA club across the country but unquestionably there are GA clubs and rugby clubs across the country that treat the women's game like that like I even know rugby, or GA clubs at home where the, the the ladies team is almost a separate entity completely to, to mm-hmm. the men's team and it's treated mm-hmm. like that in the club you look at the, the name of the club and you're thinking right that's the men's, men's team and that's the women's team but they're different entities in, in so many ways and that's where the merger I guess comes in the um, fact that they're called ladies I have to say for me oh, it's just I, I, I often say it and I'm like why am I even saying I, it I, I refuse to say it yeah, yeah. It's just it's it's dinosaur stuff yeah yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> if they if they want to go down that route then call it the gentleman's yeah yeah it's just yeah, no, I honestly, I say it so many times because that is what it is called. That's been ham- the, that is the, the it, name yeah. of it. But like, I'm like, <laughs> ladies, like, oh, we would never say get, that to each other. From the get-go, like, it's, yeah. it's ridiculous. It's, it's wrong. Uh, let us know in the comments what, what, what you make of all that in the GA, GPA report. Uh, we'll, of course, cover that story um, more heavily across the, across the rest of the week. OTBM at 7.56am with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. I did want to talk about Monaghan. I do want to talk about Monaghan. Ashley, you were at the match. That's why you... I'll just, uh, don't don't, <laughs> don't look at me. Don't be like, oh, this lad's talking about Monaghan again. We wanted to talk about it because Ashley, like myself, was at Healy Park. Come on, Jay. Yeah, don't you throw you me under the bus here. That's the excuse. It's all Ashley me. basically no, said, no, I, was, no. I was at in the pre-show meeting. I was at and James like, Grad, that's yeah, yeah, half yeah, an hour yeah, of yeah. that. Yeah, also at Fermanagh Dairy of course as well which yeah is, which sure we'll talk about that we'll talk about that <laughs> no let's get to Monaghan first uh, what did you make of it that was um, what a game what, say it was, what a game this whole phrase saved football has been thrown around but um, yeah. it, was, it was it was. who's <laughs> thrown that around it's been th- I was listening to the lads in the news round last night and they were discussing the it was an unbelievable idea. game I think we needed you know that sort of kick start to the championship mm. because I was at the Derry for Mana game the day before and it just lacked all sense of atmosphere there was no championship buzz whatsoever unfortunately but um, yeah the, the Monaghan Tyrone it's always a, a good game in Healy Park <laughs> anytime I go it seems to either go to extra time yeah. or yeah it's brilliant but yeah five points down at half time I thought Monaghan they're not at the races I thought Tyrone they looked Really, really fit. I think they'd gone easier to, an, to Tyrone in the first yeah, half. Yeah, gone to a new level. I just thought, no, Tyrone are ones to watch here. That's the way I was feeling yeah. in the first half. And then, yeah, we actually seen Monaghan come to life then in the second half. And what a finish. Oh, but it was ridiculous at the end of the game that that any self-respecting team in terms of Tyrone, what happened at that last with the goal... The parting of the seas. I honestly couldn't believe it. I was looking at the TV yeah, going, defending like oh, somebody's going to come out now at some point and put a challenge in here. Like it was crazy. Yeah, that much space it to just begin with. Walled yeah. straight Very through. smart run. Like he, he lost his space. Yeah. was keeping an eye over his shoulder, but then got drawn towards the ball and obviously gave O'Toole the the space. But they should have known that if they had but just even long before that with the move. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just the fact that it all went. It was like we've knocked it over the bar, wasn't it? It was a point yeah, for Tyrone, and then that. it was like, okay, cool, we can just we've won the match. Like, yeah. Well, it was get fifteen men behind the ball, and yeah. Monaghan won't get through us. But Carlo Connell, who was brilliant all game, just kept running through that Tyrone defence and breaking through. Kieran Duffy gets on the ball, and Kieran Duffy is often he might be a cornerback, but he's often the man at the end of Monaghan moves who takes the pot shot, and he's a very accurate shooter for a cornerback. So I was thinking when Kieran Duffy gets the ball, kick it over the bar quick. Yeah. But that, obviously then you see Ryan O'Toole inside and then once Ryan O'Toole gets the ball I'm like, alright, fist it over the <laughs> yeah, bar. Yeah. Just hurry up and fist it. And as, as he bared it oh. on goal I was I was like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> what is he doing? But I, I, I watched the, the, the Mayo game previous uh, yeah, in, in he the did last the game. Same he thing. did the exact same goal. came from the same position and just buried it. Now this was different. This was an, an occasion where you're like, he has to, he has to fist it over the bar. Yeah. And when I spoke to him after, he said I was one on one, like yeah. I, I had to go for it. Yeah. He almost felt like, you know, that's the way I've been trained, one on one. I'll get in trouble not to go for oh. a goal here. But even <laughs> you weren't one on one. He wasn't one on one. Throwing defender on the goal line yeah. as well. Like he was like, you have to live in the moment and stuff. His quotes yeah. afterwards were like, well, I was listening to that. I was definitely <laughs> like, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I thought like there would have been a part of him sort of half second guessing himself, but oh. he was probably no. No, full no. of confidence. Yes, yeah, championship debut. Unbelievable. I'm sorry, the celebration. He I know. He, so, like, as soon as the ball hits the net, he runs off and starts <laughs> doing this. It's like, I don't even know what it means, but cash money, money I guess. Money, but like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bonin were certainly in the money uh, at full time, and it was, uh, it was quite a buzz leaving. There Healy was a Park. good few videos popped up, actually. I don't know if you were paying much attention. You probably weren't very we busy, but there was a lot of people that, like, during the game, were taking videos of what was going on. Some of these people now, even, and, you know, we don't want to mention any names, but some of these people even have been really vocal about 
telling fans that they shouldn't be taking video of games. And yet here they were. No way, I didn't see this. Taking video, uh, video of some of the games. Oh, right. Yeah. All right, all right. Come on, Shane. So what Adrian is getting to, folks, is, right, I, I took a video at the end of the match just to catch the... The match the, was still on. See, I, I had thought the whistle went. No, no, and then, no, no, And then clearly on, the referee... Ridiculously, oh, by the way, played played way too much time and gave Tyrone a couple oh. of opportunities to, to launch the ball into the box. Um, but so I what did again. you get in the camera? I, I got, I I got, got nothing. He was at the opposite end of the oh. pitch. You couldn't see. <laughs> but him. I got the the man in front. The, the, <laughs> the goal the buzz, went in. The buzz, no, the buzz in the stand as the full time whistle. Okay, which, right. I mean, I wanted to experience that. I wanted. It's okay. Hold on to it for perpetuity. That, you know, you've you've relented from your ridiculous previous. This position. is different. To, this is different to LeBron James breaking the, no, the record and everyone with the phones out as he takes the shot. Were you? That's different. I, you, I didn't um, have the phone out when Rhino Tool was was pulling the trigger. Were you? Uh, were you able to do this? Were you able to do that? And then also look at the game at the same course, time. Of course, right. it was. So I'm a natural yeah. social media man. Just so, you know. Uh, but, I had to actually stand up because in Healy Park, a lot of the time, if you're not in the actual press box across mm. the way, then you're in amongst the fans, which is actually I, I enjoy. Yeah. But I had to stand up for most of that because they were all stood up getting out of their seats yeah. once the Rhino okay. Tool had scored. So I was like, I can't even see the game. <laughs> 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 yeah, so everyone was important. just standing. <laughs> it's, uh, it, if, I, if I had filmed the O'Toole goal, Adrian, I acknowledge, I would have. I would have put forward my resignation on the show on Monday morning. Yeah, I would have said I, I, I resigned my position. Unlikely, Shane. Unlikely, unlikely. No, you, you would have got like there's an awful lot more video. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's definitely an awful lot more video on your phone than your your. This is a latter day. Uh, stats, <laughs> Not going no that. doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it. Have my phone if you want, Adrian. That was the only video or photo I took of the whole the whole, ah, the whole occasion it, on Sunday. It, I have to say, it. It. <laughs> and it was tempting. You know, it was tempting the whole way home as well when you're when you're driving back and everyone is just buzzing. Modern people love beating Tyrone. Um, I think every county in Ulster loves beating Tyrone. Uh, there is that little thing. And that's first a, that's team a compliment to, to beat Tyrone. them this year in Healy Park. Yeah, well, there you go. Mm-hmm. And Monaghan beat Mayo in Castlebar as well. I'm not saying it's Monaghan's year, folks, but they'll have cer- certainly Oh, no, scalps. relax now. They'll have scalps. I'm glad you said it, actually. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not saying it's their year. But I, I do think... Their year for what? Like, Well, to, to, have, to have a serious whack. What does that even at mean? At Ulster? That's like a classic GA They're certainly going to have a whack at Ulster, but the Demon and Derry game is going to be fantastic the week after next. Um, and I can't pick a winner from that one. But but certainly... Well, Ashley, come on, you got to jump in here because I'm... I'm uh... um, it's funny, with Derry, I, a lot of people are like, yeah, there's certs now, but I, yeah. I just am not fully on the bandwagon when I was very much on it last year. So high, yeah, yeah I, I just have to probably see a little bit more. You can't tell enough from the Fermanagh game, to be honest. Um, the long, do the I long think balls that, in. Yeah, they're not ju- just some of the balls over the top. I think they would have got caught. Romana didn't catch them enough of the time that they yeah. should have. They had so many opportunities to a better team yeah. would have. But at the same time, do I think that they'll be Monaghan uh, if it if comes to that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it comes to that. They're in semi final. Sorry. Yeah. I. I. Yeah. I that's the thing. It feels like there's not. You know, whatever team loses that semi final, I don't. I wouldn't be too concerned as a Monaghan fan if Monaghan lost. You know, if you lose by a few points and you still play reasonably well. And then you have still your three, what, what yeah. three weeks to prepare for the group phase. I don't think it's the end of the world. Like, no, it would be lovely no, to win Ulster true, this yeah. year. But I mean, like Tyrone now five weeks. Yeah, which is, is nearly is too much time. A long time. That, like that, that's a lot of players going back to club football. You'd imagine in Tyrone. I know they love their club football in Tyrone, so they will probably go back. Most of them, um, give them the next week or two off, possibly because three weeks is more than enough time to prep for that. Yeah, five weeks is a lot of time. I don't know. You could look at it both ways to have a bit of time to. Uh, work on things mm. really get yourself right Mayo I'm sure looking at it like that but at the same time not having that you know match yeah. games it's, it's just tough I think to be at that level Chris on YouTube here is saying uh, talking about dinosaurs using the term ladies while at the same time calling the uh, GFA as in the Good Friday dream- Agreement the Belfast Agreement um, uh, Mary McAleese herself called it the Belfast yeah. Good Friday Agreement so I'm just uh, putting that in the quoting the great Mary McAleese yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> covering myself actually, yeah. that's right. that's 100%. on that note Adrian thanks a million cheers for popping in as always 8.04am on this Wednesday morning's OTBAM uh, now we will be hosting a live UEFA Champions League roadshow in partnership with Just Eat it's coming your way on May the 3rd it'll be in the Mansion House in Dublin we will be joined by UEFA Champions League winners John O'Shea and Wes Brown along with Arsenal legend Paul Merson. It is sure to be a brilliant night's entertainment. This is an exclusive off-air event and tickets are limited, so don't delay. Go to offtheball.com forward slash events and we will see you on the night. Just Eat, the official food delivery partner of the UEFA Championship.